So Shaliza is an equity inclusion learning coach and a Harvard graduate. She brings with her over a decade of experience in teaching, training, and developing programs aimed at addressing inequitable outcomes for underserved communities. Shaliza uses an interactive approach, often embedded with theater-based techniques to develop a sense of embodied empathy and engage participants in rich dialogue. Her work is responsive and leaves participants with practical tools for engagement. So again, thank you very much for joining us today and stepping in um, on such short notice to give this very important talk um, to our larger audience. Um, so first and foremost, where are you joining us from today? Thank you. I'm from here from Toronto joining you. So it's a nice morning here. We had lots of rain last night and it's nice and sunny today. So thank you all for being here. Great to hear. Um, so while we enjoy this talk on this lovely Saturday morning here um, in New York and you're there from Toronto, uh, we'll all be tuning in. So um, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about myself. So thinking about my social identity, I identify as East African. My mom is born in Kenya and my dad is born in Uganda and I'm Gujarati, I'm Indian descent. And I'm Canadian. Um, I'm born in Vancouver, British Columbia, and now I live in Toronto. Uh, so we call ourselves South Asian in Canada. Uh, I know that uh, that might be Asian American in the States. I'm Ismaili Muslim. That's a really big part of my identity. I'm under five feet tall. You can't tell because I'm sitting down. Um, I'm a daughter, a sister, and a girlfriend. I'm a loyal friend to many, and that's kind of who I am. And then professionally, I'm an artist. So I've been a dancer, actor, and singer uh, from a very young age. And theater is my most prominent uh, art form that I practice. I'm an educator, a high school teacher, um, most likely teaching grade 11 and 12 usually, so juniors and seniors. I'd be your teacher. And as Hethel said, I'm an equity, diversity, and inclusion coach. Both professionally, I work with the Toronto District School Board, which is the largest school board in Canada. And I work as an inclusion coach, working with teachers and principals and students to help create inclusive communities, especially around diverse learning needs. I'm an entrepreneur. I have my own business where I do coaching and facilitation for organizations like lawyers, like arts organizations, thinking about how they can foster a community of diversity, equity and inclusion in their working space and really thinking about hot topics such as bias and how they can overcome bias in the workplace. I'm a public speaker, so I speak at different events to different students. My students are my favorite audience to talk to, and I'm a world traveler, and I'll show you a few pictures soon. I love traveling the world. I was grateful to have an opportunity to see different countries growing up, and really that's the best uh, way that I've learned about different people. So here are some pictures about me. Um, so I graduated last year, uh, just a little over a year ago from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, which was a great accomplishment for me. And I'll tell you all about that and how I sort of doubted myself on the journey and sometimes still do. On the top right, you can see um, I love dressing up. Uh, I love to be fancy and I love performing. So that's me getting ready at a Halloween party, probably around age five. Um, and my friends tell me I'm still on trend with my fishnets and my bow tie. And then my favorite animals are elephants. And so that is a picture of uh, me in Thailand taking a break last year and going to Thailand and working at the Elephant Conservatory uh, to look at supporting uh, elephants that were um, injured in the workplace, actually. Some of these elephants were used for labor, uh, carrying really big logs or chained. And so I was working with them. And then the bottom is something I love to do again, performing. This is a performance I got to do with a dear friend um, at Harvard last year at the Box Center for Arts, which is a really cool place. When you're in Boston, you should check it out. And the top left is about 10 years ago. Uh, that is me hang gliding in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, which was very scary, um, but it was a real thrill. So I love adventure and I love travel. And that's a little bit about me. And if you have questions, feel free to ask them at the end. <clears throat> So I was asked to tell you a little bit about what my day looks like. And this year has been different than, <clears throat> excuse me, days in the past. But as I was saying to you, sometimes I will be running workshops for educators, for principals, for support staff. Sometimes I'll be working with students, as you can see in the center picture. And I think they're all about the same height as me. That's a grade five class. <clears throat> sometimes I'll be working 
with a group of teachers or a group of coaches, which we have at the school board, thinking about ideas to make education better for all of you beautiful students. In the bottom is me running a mentorship program for teachers who want to be leaders, who want to be principals, who really want to think about how they can support learners of today and tomorrow. And the top left there, <clears throat> that was us thinking about how can we engage you in social media? So that was us actually talking about engaging in biology and stem cells through uh, speed dating. So it's pretty fun. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I wanted to share this. It's a gift, but it's not working, but that's okay. Because I really wanted to share um, how I feel life is and how my journey in my career has been. I don't think it's always been a linear path. It's really been a roller coaster with ups and downs. And I actually love roller coasters. I love the thrill of sitting in the front or the back of the roller coaster and the uphill climb. And I love putting my hands up when I do that first dip because I know that it's gonna be uncomfortable, but I always know that the dip is gonna come back up. And so for me, I feel like life has ups and downs. There's turns, there's twists. Sometimes there's tunnels, you don't know what's going to happen. And I really use that analogy <clears throat> for life because we don't really know what's going to happen. We do have some choice and we do know how we can control it. For example, I can keep my hands up in that roller coaster. I can keep them on the handlebar. I can make sure that my seatbelt's really tied. <clears throat> so I wanted to start to tell you a little bit about where I started. So I was saying that I'm a performer and for me, I always knew that I wanted to act. And when I was in grade 11 and 12, I thought, okay, what if I can't get an acting job right away? And my parents were saying to me, you know, you need to have a career that is gonna be sustainable, that can help you survive. And they really supported me with my acting. But I started an internship in Vancouver. We had to do 150 volunteer hours. So I started a volunteer internship at a physiotherapy clinic. And I really loved working with people. And that's when I first really know, knew that I loved helping people. And so I said, okay, maybe I'll become a physiotherapist um, as a side to my acting. So I took a lot of sciences, physics, math, and then in grade 12, I had a new math teacher and I couldn't understand a word he was saying about math. So I decided to drop that course. And I knew that that meant that I had to follow my passion. I said, you know what? I'm not going to um, take this course if it's not really what I wanna do. Instead, I'm gonna focus on my acting. So I went to university and I went to the university for acting. I really wanted to go to New York, but my parents were a little scared to let me move all the way across the country and then to the States, especially as a Canadian, not knowing much about America. So I went to school at York University and I studied theater and um, I was happy with my decision. I knew that uh, physiotherapy was something I had loved, but it wasn't a passion and it wasn't something that I wanted to do long-term. So I went into acting because that was my passion. I completed a degree in theater. And then I graduated and I was doing my acting. I had an agent, but I knew that I wanted to be able to afford to travel still and to have my own apartment. So I worked at the Osgood Hall Law School, which is a big law school here in Toronto, world renowned actually. And I worked in their master's program and I still acted. And then I had another twist and turn. I got offered a gig to do an acting show, a theater performance, and I had to make a decision if I wanted to stay in my role or if I wanted to leave and do this position and this, this title role, this principal lead actor in a show. And so I chose my passion again and I left my job and I was performing in this show. And then after that, I decided to go back and work again at York University. And then another opportunity came up for me, another twist and turn that I didn't think about. I started to work as a cultural arts manager. So I did fundraising and marketing for arts organizations. And that took me to different cities in Ontario where I got to meet different people. I got to do um, educational programming and I got to think about the passion I do today, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the art space. I also got to work on high school programming and thinking about what do high school students wanna see on the stage. So that was really cool. And then something else came up for me. I thought to myself, you know what else I really want to do with my life? I really want to volunteer for one year abroad. And I'd always wanted to go back to Kenya, where my mom was from. I had gone as a child, but I had never spent extensive time there. And they had opened a new school there called the Aga Khan Academy in Mombasa, which is in the coast. If you ever have a chance to go to the coast, it's beautiful, really nice beaches. 
So I had the chance to go and I told myself I was taking a year off to travel because that's what I really wanted to do. And at that time I had turned 25. I was feeling, oh my gosh, I'm a quarter century old, which is not old by the way. But I had a little bit of a dip and a turn in my roller coaster. So I went to Mombasa, Kenya and I volunteered. And my sister told me, you're not gonna last a week with all the cockroaches, the heat, and the, the, the animals and the food, you're not gonna last, but I lasted a year. So I taught um, music, dance, and drama at the Aga Khan um, uh, Academy in Mombasa, and I absolutely loved it. And that's when I knew that I really wanted to go and do my bachelor's of education and become a teacher. So I traveled a little bit, that's when you saw the hang gliding picture. I did some traveling before I came back, and I came back and I went to teacher's college, as we call it here, to get my bachelor's of education, which is required to do um, your teacher's college. But I'll tell you something I forgot to tell you before. I had actually thought about teaching as a backup to my acting before I graduated from my undergrad when I was studying theater. And I had applied twice and I didn't get in. And I went to talk to the dean and I asked her, what can I do better? And she simply said, oh, we just had a lot of applicants. So I could have given up and said, okay, you know what? I tried twice, I didn't get in, that's it. Instead, I applied again, my third time. I think it was my third time and I got in. So I, I say that to you to say that sometimes it's just the path and it's just the ride of the roller coaster that you don't get into a program the first time or it's just not the right time for you. So here I was back from Mombasa and in teacher's college and I loved it. I was training to teach um, grades seven to 12 and then ended up with a job the next year teaching grade um, 11 and 12 to 18 to 21 year old youth who had not finished high school. And it was a great experience. So I've been doing that for quite a while now. I did that for, I guess I'd say nine years. I became a curriculum leader, which means basically the same thing as a department head where I got to run a department, an arts department and a social science department, which was really cool. And I'd always wanted to do my master's. So I saw this program called Arts in Education at Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I thought, wow, that would be amazing. But guess what? I didn't believe in myself. It took me four years to get the courage to even apply. And when I did, I got in. I was really, really proud of myself, but I still didn't feel that confident. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what I was experiencing. Now here I am, I graduated and I came back to work at the Toronto District School Board and I got a job as a K-12 inclusion learning coach. But I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. My role was for two years, but our government changed and our funding got cut. So my job got cut. So I was defeated, but I only let myself get defeated for two days. And then I applied for more jobs. And last week I got another job as a K-12 inclusion learning consultant for special education. So that's really good. I keep trying and keep going up and down. And sometimes life's gonna throw me curveballs. It's gonna throw me up and down this roller coaster, but I'm still gonna enjoy the ride. My entrepreneurial life is where I started my own business exactly a year ago to work with organization and individuals to coach them around inclusive design of their practices, specifically around power and privilege in the workplace, unconscious bias. How can we think about providing opportunities and engaging different communities in our workplace, in our schools, and in our communities. And I can tell you a bit more about that later on. So here I tell you again, how did I get there? How did I get to be an equity and inclusion coach? I stopped, I turned directions, I tried and tried again. It wasn't linear, it definitely wasn't. Sometimes it felt like that middle picture where I was climbing a mountain Sometimes I saw that sunset, sometimes I didn't. Sometimes it was really difficult, but I kept going with my path. And the far picture on the right, as you can see, it definitely wasn't straight. I went around and around different curves and I changed my career decisions. I uh, changed my trajectory of where I wanted to go and how I wanted to do it many times. And like I said, it took me four years to apply for graduate school. And when I did, I was successful. And so that just shows you that sometimes the right timing um, it may not be the right timing, or, or you can try again and things can work out for you. So that's one of my biggest messages. And if you listen to 90s um, R&B or, or 2000s even R&B, I really believe in the line Aaliyah says, dust yourself off and try again, because that's the only way um, that we can get what we need if it's meant for us. 
So I told you a little bit about why it took me four years to apply for graduate school, um, why it took me till I was 25 to go and volunteer for a year, and why sometimes even today as a grown adult, I feel not so confident. And when I went to graduate school, that's when I learned this word imposter syndrome. I didn't even know what this meant. I just knew that sometimes I didn't feel so good. I knew that telling people that I was going to Harvard was really tough. I knew that sometimes being an actor wasn't as glamorous as people who were going to med school. And I kind of felt down on myself. So I learned this word was called imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome means that it's a feeling that you think your achievements are not real or that you do not deserve the praise or the success. Or in other words, the belief that your successes are due to luck rather than your abilities and your merit. So for example, when I got into teacher's college, instead of saying in the beginning, oh wow, it's my third time, I really deserve this, it's the right time for me, sometimes I thought, did they make a mistake? Did they really want me? Why didn't they let me in all those other times? Maybe this was just a fluke. And I didn't really think about how it was meant for me at that time. I had worked really hard and I deserved to be there because I was going to be an amazing teacher. So that was how imposter syndrome kicked in. Imposter syndrome kicked in for me as well when I was getting my acceptance to Harvard because I thought if I tell people where I'm going, they're not going to believe me. They're going to think, oh, I was a result of affirmative action or as you saw in the media these days, all those scandals around celebrities <clears throat> paying for their kids to get into um, Ivy League schools. I thought, Maybe someone's going to think I bribed someone. Maybe they made a mistake. Maybe they're going to email me any day and say, sorry, Shaliza, but we've made a mistake. You're actually not in the school. So that settled with me for a long time. And in my mid-30s, I'm admitting to you that imposter syndrome comes and goes, just like a tide, in and out sometimes. But there's luck. You can uh, manage your imposter syndrome. You can overcome your imposter syndrome if you're experiencing it. So below, I invite you to think about you belong. You belong in your space, whether that's your community, whether that's your school, whether that's a school that you want to apply for. And you do have a lot to contribute. So before we go on, I want you to think about yourself. And I want you to think about what you are ready to take on. So you can see on the screen, it says, you are ready to take on blank. I want you to think about what you're ready to take on. Fill in that blank for yourself, write it down, Think about it, post it on your mirror. I post it on the inside of my mirror so I think about it every day when I'm going to brush my teeth. Put it in your notebook, on your phone, whatever it is. Really think about what it is that you have to contribute and what you wanna take on. And then it's okay to feel that you don't always have the confidence because you sometimes do experience imposter syndrome. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So imposter syndrome, how do we cope with it? The first thing I say to you, if you're feeling this way, if you feel like you're not really where you wanna be or that you are where you wanna be, but you're not sure that you deserve it, is really think about self-compassion. Meet yourself where you're at and take it one day at a time. Be kind to yourself, accept compliments, and really practice gratitude. Put your thoughts and feelings in perspective. Why am I feeling this way? What's made me feel this way? And something I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is our social identities. Many of us, my parents were new immigrants to Canada. They studied university here. I was born in this country, but I'm still a woman of color, a short woman of color and a minority. I'm a Muslim, a Shia Muslim. And so sometimes I feel as though uh, I have to work 10 times as hard, which is not fair. And that is part of what we call systemic oppression or internalized racism as well. So sometimes as newcomers, as immigrants, as people of color, we often experience imposter syndrome more than a white person might. And that is because of these systemic inequities. So it's really important to be kind to ourselves and compassionate. The next thing is self-affirmations. So really back to the slide before I was talking about thinking about what are your values? What do you believe? For example, one of my values is loyalty and honesty. That's really important to me. And I'm not going to let that waver. And what are my strengths? Think of yourself in an asset based lens. And what I mean by that is when you think that you're achieving something, whether it's getting MVP on your basketball team, or whether it's winning an award or getting into the college of your dreams, think about what your strengths are. 
What got you there? And then I always ask you to think about your superpower. Take a minute and think about what is your superpower? My superpower is that I'm considerate and compassionate of others. And I'm really proud of that. Lastly, remember that when you feel doubt, it's normal. And it's up and down like a wave or like my roller coaster analogy. The last thing is, it's important to ground yourself when you're feeling imposter syndrome or when you feel like it's creeping up and you're not feeling confident. Surround yourself with friendly and familiar people, places, and memories. Practice self-care. Seek a trusted friend or a therapist or guidance counselor to help you out. Here's some more tips and tools. Now, if you saw this or if you download this PowerPoint, you'll see that Beyonce is walking in as a queen in this GIF. Some really quick recaps of tips and tools. Always be kind to yourself and accept those compliments. Have positive self-talk. Challenge the negative talk that you might be feeling. I'm not good enough. I don't deserve this. And replace it with positive self-talk because confidence is key. And remember that we are all works in progress and embrace the stage you're currently in. Identify your strengths. What are you good at? What do you bring to the table? Everyone has strengths and own those strengths. Replace can't with can. Think about what are the things that you can do. I remember when I was in ballet class, my dance teacher had a rule that we could never use the word can't. It could not be in our vocabulary. Instead, we would try to think about how we could do something or what we could do instead. Practice gratitude. So when I think about that, I practice gratitude through a gratitude jar. I have a little jar, a mason jar at home, and when good things happen, I write them down. So that when I'm not feeling the best about myself or I'm feeling that imposter syndrome creeping up, I open the jar and I pull something out and I read it to myself. So I'll give you an example. Something I might write in my gratitude jar is, I'm really grateful that I got to sleep in, or I'm really grateful for summer sunny days because we haven't got a lot of sun this summer. Or I might write something like, I'm really grateful that I was asked to speak to all of you today because that means a lot to me. Or it could be, I'm really grateful to have friends and people to count on or listen to. So different things that you can write um, down that you're practicing gratitude with. Sometimes you don't have to write it down, whatever works for you. You can write it in a journal, you can write it on paper, or just have it in your mind. Accept compliments. This is a hard thing to do. But for me, this is really a part of uh, overcoming imposter syndrome. When someone gives you a compliment, congratulates you on something, instead of saying, yes, but, or, oh, it was not really me, or it was some other person, or giving excuses, simply say thank you and accept your compliment. I find that helps with me. Something that I showed you in a slide previously uh, was my power pose. And I mean like standing with your arms on your corner or like Beyonce there or like any superhero and practicing your power pose. Because when we practice our body language of power and confidence, we will internalize that. Studies have shown that. So when you fake it till you make it, you will make it. Stand tall, stand proud, have your posture up and your hands out and know that you can do it. The next one I spoke about a little earlier as well is about finding your support. Find your tribe or your squad. Who, is the, who are the people who are there for you, who are going to support you when you're up and you're down, when you're on the high, on the low of the roller coaster and up and down those waves? Find them. Seek them out and weed out the people who are not good for you and who have negative self-talk. And lastly, as I said before, have those circle of friends and mentors, but embrace the journey. Because as I said to you, imposter syndrome is not something that um, comes and goes, uh, comes and goes and is gone forever. Instead, it can come and go at different points in your life. It can be gone for five years. You may not experience it ever, and then all of a sudden you experience it when some a milestone occurs for you. So now I wanna talk a little bit about social media because imposter syndrome can be fueled by social media. And what I mean by that is if you see these images here, you'll see that we're always thinking about our likes. 
right? So you might be thinking about likes or love. So I, I quote this chronic song, but I'm sure you've heard of this. Do you do it for the likes or do you do it for the love? And so are you thinking about how many followers you have? Is, is that what you're worried about? Or do you do it just to put yourself out there? Because when it comes to media, social media, we can be scrolling for hours and hours. And the important thing is that social media only presents one side. It's a snapshot, um, you know, either a, what is it, three second video on Snapchat or Instagram or a picture on Facebook or a picture on Instagram. It's an instant hit. And often it shows just the highlights and not the lowlights of someone's life. I mean, who would wanna take a picture of them in having a bad day, right? With their makeup running and crying and or just not feeling good. You always see people at their best in their positive light. And it's really, really important to make sure that you can understand and critically analyze and think about what you're seeing on social media. It's also important to remember that in this digital age, we're looking at sound bites, image bites that are coming to us really, really fast. And we get used to this instant gratification. So it's important to slow down, give ourselves time and stop the mindless scrolling. I'm guilty too. Before I go to bed and sometimes when I wake up, you know, it's my routine to scroll through my phone and my Instagram feed. And sometimes I see everyone, um, you know, at a certain stage of their life where I might want to be or um, very successful. And I think, wait a minute, I have a good life too. Why am I comparing myself to others? So that's the last thing. Why are we having this comparing game? Avoid the comparing game and comparing ourselves to other people. Because remember, Individuals are always putting their best foot forward. The other thing that's really important is depression, anxiety, and stress can manifest through the comparing game and the mindless scrolling on social media. Not only from looking at those images, but from the, the waves and the, the light that's reflected in your eyes. It's just not healthy for you. And studies show that students, adults, anyone of any age can suffer from anxiety, depression, from looking at all these media images that just show positive sides if they're comparing themselves. So we'll go on to the next slide about how we can deal with this. So let's think more about imposter syndrome and social media. What are some things you can do? It's really important to limit your screen time and take breaks. Recently, I was out with her friend and her husband and three kids had set a timer on her phone. So she went to look at Instagram and it said, Time limit reached. I had never seen that before, but they set it for her on her phone. There's also um, an app on your phone um, that can track all your time spent on social media and give you a little report so that you can be aware of how much time you're spending. But it's really important to get out, get some fresh air, and limit the time online so that you can see that not everything is about the best Instagram shot or the best Instagram pose. Although we know that we take way more selfies and so many takes, maybe a hundred takes to get that perfect picture. The second thing I say is spend time with friends in real life. Get to know that there's ebbs and flows in life. We're gonna have good days, we're gonna have bad days. Again, avoid comparing yourself. Really stay out of that comparing game. And how you can avoid comparing yourself is through those things I told you about imposter syndrome, right? You can practice gratitude, think about your strengths and what you bring to the table and really focus on your goals. That will help you to stop comparing yourself. And then share your successes and failures. So if you are sharing on Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Snapchat or Twitter, sometimes it's good to share the things that aren't so good either, right? Your successes and your failures because that helps people grow and learn as well. And it helps us to make a little footprint about showing the lowlights and the highlights, because that is real life. Real life is not just about positives. So I wanted to actually, I'm gonna go back one slide. I wanted to share a few more things. I put this link in the resources, but I wanted to tell you that I was talking about the rates of anxiety and depression, and social media has actually been proven to increase those rates. And I wanted to direct you to a link in the resources from the Journal of Social and Clinical Psychology. And it's known that people who are scrolling through posts and experience often experience FOMO. I'm sure you know what FOMO is, but for those of you who don't, it's fear of missing out. 
And that fear of missing out often also can cause people to envy others and can perpetuate imposter syndrome when we are looking at what others have accomplished or what we aim to accomplish or have accomplished. So if we promote uh, taking breaks from social media, then we can have a better sense of well-being and really focus on our own mental health. And we can focus on those real life interactions with people. We can also increase our productivity. I can't tell you how many times I kicked myself because I was online all night and didn't study for a test or an interview, right? So how can we more, be more productive and grow our social media presence for a possible career or acceptance to university? And also uh, thinking about, you know, um, how our footprint is created. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more, but really thinking about how when we post something online, it's there forever. Even if you delete it, it's saved somewhere in the cybersphere. And we were talking about, um, Hithil and I were talking about how recently students who had posted something two years ago that was discriminatory, it was found on social media and their acceptance to a college was revoked. A few years ago, some students also made some comments in a private Facebook group that was private these um, comments got discovered and their admittance to Harvard was revoked. So we really have to be careful about how we present ourselves. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. All right, so how can we use social media effectively to support our positive well-being and share our strengths and grow our confidence? So like I said, digital footprints are permanent. When you post something on Instagram, social media, uh, Snapchat, even though it's 24 hours, it can be archived. And I'm not sure if you knew this, but Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, once you post something, they own your contact. Contra, uh, sorry, they own your content. So make sure that you're looking through that contract that you signed that says agree when you're creating an Instagram account, for example, because all of those legals are there. They own your content. You don't. Secondly, present your best self in your personal and professional life. I don't mean always your positives. I mean, represent yourself like you are creating a personal brand. So if you're using, for example, I use Twitter a lot for work. As educators, we use Twitter a lot to share the work we're doing, to share uh, pedagogy or philosophies around education. So I post and I repost and I tweet out pictures and images of students, but I have to make sure a few things. Do I have permission to share those pictures? Are they my own content? is what I'm writing my own content. Also, I have to really think about what I'm representing. So when I have photographs of myself on social media, especially on Twitter, I wanna make sure that I'm representing who I am. So I'm an equity and inclusion coach and an educator. I want people to see that from my images. So the way I dress, the way I present myself will be accordingly. As well, I wanna think about the positive and negative consequences of what I post. So sometimes, as we talked about imposter syndrome and fear of missing out, what we post can negatively affect other people. So we wanna make sure that we're being inclusive and that we're being equitable and that we're thinking about others' feelings as well as ours before we post something. Then it's important to be aware of the positive and negative consequences. If we decide to comment on someone's picture, um, you know, cyberbullying has become unfortunately a really big concern in the digital age. So are we harming others are we harming ourselves? Are we reporting uh, cyberbullying? Are we making sure that we're not engaging in cyberbullying? So that could be, you know, body shaming, making negative comments about people's posts. We're really thinking about our comments too, because those are also permanent, even if we delete them. Again, share, post, and repost, and celebrate your journey, your successes, and your challenges. That's really important to help others. So a few tips I have. I really like LinkedIn. If you're a junior, a senior, even if you're in grade nine, a sophomore, freshman, if you're a young professional starting out in your career, LinkedIn is really important. It's really important for you to start building your social media presence in professional and personal ways. So I think it's great for everyone to have a LinkedIn profile where if you're a junior, a senior, or even younger, you can shape your volunteer experience and really create a profile that's based on a career that you aspire to have or a volunteer job that you aspire to have, or something that you want. And a lot of universities these days are looking, excuse me, at your LinkedIn profile when they're looking at acceptances. So what can you do on LinkedIn? Have a professional photo and really share your story. 
if you've got volunteer experience, let's say if you want to be a teacher, for example, and you've got volunteer experience working at a daycare, helping out in your school, you can carve all of that into your LinkedIn profile so others can view it. You can add uh, pictures there. You can write content and share articles. Let's say if you're trying to be a teacher, you can share articles about education on there. On Twitter, again, you've got 140 characters, so you can create your presence there. For me, I personally don't use Snapchat, but I use Instagram. And I try to use Instagram for closer knit circles and for my personal life. So I'll share things like birthday pictures. I'll share things about my workshops, but I keep it closed. So I have a private account with my own circle because that's what works for me. But even though it's a private circle, I know that people are always watching and sharing information and posts and people can screenshot. So I make sure that I represent myself in the way that I want to be seen as professional, as caring, compassionate, and considerate of other people's feelings. So I also say celebrate all of these things. I'm happy to answer any questions about how to really create accounts for different purposes and how to link them um, and how to create basically um, your brand through social media. Before we get to questions, I want to share another motivational um, quote. I actually took this photo in a dollar store. It was a sparkle, a little box with sparkles and sprinkles. And it says, believe in yourself and you will be unstoppable. I want to share that for you because that's how I needed that message that day and it showed up for me. And I want to share it with you because it's so important to believe in yourself because that's when you will be unstoppable in anything you do, whether you're trying to make the volleyball team, whether you really want to apply to a certain college, whether you want a certain volunteer job, whatever it may be now in the future, believe in yourself. I have some additional resources for you. I made them into links so you can click on them, some more to read, but there's tons of videos, TEDx talks and YouTube videos about imposter syndrome. There's lots of videos. I put a little blog of my own there about how I talked about creating confidence and creating a digital media presence. So there's lots of resources out there and it's up to you to really think about critically analyzing or weeding out what's good and what's bad in the medium. And you'll get there um, with your skills. You'll be able to um, think about what is good news, what is fake news, what is negative news and start to really think about how much time you spend online and focus on you. So I have the last little image for you before I get to questions is I really liked this quote. If you stumble, make it part of the dance. So just like that roller coaster up and down, part of the same ride, if by chance you stumble or if you um, are successful, make it all part of the same dance. No one will be able to tell. And always, always believe in yourself. Thank you. Love that. That's uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. Welcome. We really appreciate it. And I love that quote. Um, I mean, I dance as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the most important uh, kind of tactics I've learned to be a good dancer was to never uh, even have a misstep be a reason that you stop mm -hmm. dancing. Mm -hmm. It's just part of the dance and you keep going. And that's when I, I know when I was um, learning to perform, that's when I started getting more compliments was when, even if I made a mistake, I kept going and nobody noticed mm -hmm. because it was the energy and it was, um, that it was the energy that was infectious. So thank you so much for um, your talk. I'd love to just have a couple of questions and um, sure. like to see if uh, we can clarify kind of what you might have done at some points. I know you've been very vulnerable through this entire, um, like this entire talk, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. You shared, and I believe it was, um, I mean, I, I think it was around perhaps here where you said that it took you four years. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had applied to teach um, Teachers College for three times. Um, what were some things, I mean, you, got, you asked for feedback as well, which I think a lot of people don't do. Um, especially when they're they end up taking the failure the first time and they don't bounce back from it. So congratulations for overcoming that. That's number one. Yeah. What was some of the feedback that you received um, if you did receive yeah. it three times? I know sometimes um, or twice, sometimes they don't give feedback. Yeah. But 
what upon receiving it, what did you do so that you, you know, um, here you provide some suggestions yeah. as to what you can do, like what are your strengths? So what are some activities that you might have done given sure. that feedback? Sure. So one of the feedbacks I got was not quite helpful. It was more like you didn't click off the box that you are a person of color. And so we didn't have enough spots. So I took that and I said, okay, maybe this isn't the faculty I want to be part of. But the other feedback um, that I got from peers who got in was I don't think I had enough volunteer experience that was recent. I had volunteered from grade four till grade 12 in my school. But now being in university, I didn't have Ontario, because I was in a different province, relevant volunteer experience. Now, I kind of got that from my peers. And I also talked about it with other professors. So that, you know what, I'm going to go and volunteer. And so I made more opportunities for myself to equip my skills to work with youth um, in different areas. So I volunteered in a, a school and I also started teaching arts uh, to school age students. So what I say was one of the things I was okay, I looked at the gap, said, okay, I need this experience to get to where I am or where I want to be. So how can I equip myself with those experiences? I also um, sought out mentors. So I thought about people who were doing the jobs that I wanted to do. And I thought about, let me see if they'll have a conversation with me. And more often than not, they were really happy to have a conversation with me to let me know how they could get, um, how they could support me and figure out what were the gaps that I needed. It also really helped me because it reminded me that there's nothing wrong with me. I didn't not get in because I wasn't good enough or I wasn't smart. And that took me a long time. Um, and the way I overcame that was a lot of self-talk. And, um, you know, really telling myself, no, I am smart. Look at all the other accomplishments I've done. You know, I finished my undergraduate degree. Um, I've gone on to win, do this and do that and win these awards. So it's not that I'm not smart. It's just not the right time for me. And there's a gap. So it's positive self-talk, seeking out mentors, going through the tough days and believing in yourself. And some of the strategies I did for that were uh, journaling. I did a lot of journaling. Um, I also like to watch lots of positive videos. That helps me. I always love to call a friend. That's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah, it's always important to have champions mm -hmm. um, who can then uh, just share with you, especially when you're doubting yourself, share with you the things that you do bring to the table or um, to any environment, any context, really. So thank you for sharing that. I think um, um, oftentimes we take a failure and we don't respond to the possible feedback. So again, just acknowledging that the way that you can overcome imposter syndrome is by listening to why you didn't necessarily fit into that context the first time, if that's the case. Um, and then what you can do to, to make yourself feel that you do belong um, next time you get the opportunity. So that, I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, so even given that you had the four years before you applied, so this, we see this a lot even with women, right? There's so many different articles and uh, um, different uh, research that highlights that women need to be perfect in order to even apply. Um, they don't take the opportunities as much. So given that you you already overcome this with the different activities that you've done and um, you'd already now completed your, your grad degree, you still waited four years. So walk us a little bit through what you might be thinking. And if there was a young woman who, um, you know, she's also kind of gone through year one, maybe going through three yeah. year two, or she just doesn't think she's good enough right now and she's yeah. waiting the four years. Why might she just, or what might you suggest so that she actually jump in like most often men do? Right, yes, that's a hard one. You know, for me, I think the key, the secret ingredient, which I'm really still working on, and if you listen to my podcast, you'll see is confidence. I think the confidence to know that if you get in, if you don't get in, you're still amazing. And I think it's that mentality again. I really liked um, the graphic that I found which said stop, try again, go this way. Because I think it's about trying again and again and again. And that requires a word called resilience, right? It's the ability to bounce back from a situation, whether it's negative or um, not your ideal outcome. And so for me, in that four years, I'll tell you a few things I did. I was afraid of failure, actually. I was so afraid of failure, I didn't try. And this is a common theme for me. I was afraid that I wouldn't get in, so I didn't get in. That's kind of not really logical. So instead, I made excuses. I have a mortgage, I have a partner here, I have a job. 
So my advice would be kind of like, think about eliminating the barriers for yourself, because sometimes we are the ones who create the barriers. Um, and of course, as you said, as women and women of color, there are systemic barriers, but we can overcome them. So in that four years, if I could do things differently, I would have said, you know what? It doesn't matter if I don't get in the first time, I should apply because I could have been done four years ago. So I think about that I, and, and my advice is, if you want something, go for it. If you don't get in the first time or you don't achieve it the first time, reflect, take a deep breath, reflect, think about what went well, what didn't, what could you do differently, what feedback was there, and remember that sometimes it has nothing to do with you. And I would suggest that for, for the ladies. Um, and, I, and I also think that for me, um, it was sort of reaffirming when I just applied and got in. Um, not that it was easy, but that if I had believed in myself the way I did for uh, it, then, that four years ago, perhaps I could have applied myself. And so it was validating and reassuring, um, but it was sort of like the message that was that I took a risk on myself and I put myself out there and look what I could achieve. And that's why I really like that sparkle um, graphic. I'm just gonna go to it really quickly. Because for me, the only person who was in my way was myself. Nobody else was stopping me from applying to Harvard, only me. I had to put in my application, complete all of that. That's all hard work, of course, but there was no one in my way but me. And that's why I really like this because I think if you believe in yourself, you will be unstoppable because you can try again and again, but you will be unstoppable. And so we need to get out of our own way. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think it also goes back to what you said was one critical thing that you did, which is in our name, is uh, you got yourself mentors. Yeah. So, so often we feel imposter syndrome and you mentioned that, you know, we may feel this as people of color um, more so more so than white people. It's because we don't see ourselves um, enough in certain contexts. And so we then... Um, we then put a descriptor on ourselves saying that we got in because of a quota or we got in because of, um, you know, they needed to fill in that you're a person of color. Mm -hmm. um, and they, that might not even have been the reason that might have just, you know, and, and although that was part of the feedback, that's just sometimes easy feedback and there's always something more to it. Um, so getting yourself a mentor, this is kind of why we do the speaker series. We want the young people to see people like you who've already been there, done that, um, even if the pictures that they're so accustomed to seeing about those spaces don't reflect um, your people, like people who have um, kind of like your background, your culture, yeah. your ethnicity. And so um, when you got those mentors, what were you seeking in those mentors mm -hmm. so that you, one, so that you kind of helped yourself get over imposter syndrome? Mm -hmm. And then two, what kinds of advice did they give you to then help you overcome, overcome imposter syndrome? Sure. And I will say that I think um, as an adult, I think mentorship is even more important to me and I'm always sort of seeking out mentors. So I think what I looked for was I looked for mostly women of color. So someone who shared, shared some social identities with me that could relate to what I was going through. Um, I sought out mentors who were almost like where I wanted to be. So educators or I sought out people who I thought had my best interests in mind. Um, because that's important. Um, today, I seek out people who are in the school board with me, who are doing leadership roles, who kind of, um, who I know we kind of fit together because I think that synergy or that energy is really important. So when you're finding a mentor, it's important to find someone who you think you connect with and jive with, and also someone who has the time to support you um, and that you have the time to kind of be accountable to each other. And so sometimes that's formal mentorship, sometimes it's informal mentorship, or what one of my mentors says to me is, I don't call it mentorship, I call it sponsorship, because is that person gonna kinda sponsor you in terms of putting your name forward for things or really going out of their way to support you? So I was looking for people who um, I first had a conversation with and I knew that we got along, that we had a connection. And I also looked at um, a mutual relationship. So for example, um, a mentor of mine right now in the school board, she's essentially assigned principal. And I haven't said to her, can you be my mentor? But I'll reach out to her, I'll call her when I have a question, when I'm applying for a job, when I'm not sure of something, when I'm feeling imposter syndrome. And I know from her experiences that she um, understands how that feels, so she'll um, let me know how that feels and she'll be honest with me. 
And then sometimes when she needs support, she'll say, Shaliza, can you be a judge at the robotics festival? I'm 100% there because that's how I think the mentorship relationship works. It's give and take. So that's kind of what I look for for a mentor. Again, someone who shares social identities as me. We can develop a relationship. I make sure that there's synergy there. I respect their time and I can give and take. Now, advice that I've gotten from my mentors um, as recently as two weeks ago, they told me, Shaliza, don't sell yourself short. Um, no pun intended. Uh, go out there and get uh, what you what you can go out and get apply for any role that you want. Don't sell yourself short. Um, apply yourself and and put yourself out there. And the second thing that I've been told a lot is to not worry about what other people think, say, or do, and how people treat me. Um, instead, to let myself sparkle, let myself stumble while I dance, but don't worry about what the other people are doing. Because sometimes um, I can fall into the comparison trap compare myself to others or worry about what other people are saying, thinking or doing to me or feeling uh, or saying about me. So um, that was the big thing. Don't compare myself and keep going and believing in myself and to always crush my goals and it, that it's okay if I don't get into a program or I don't do something because it's better to have tried and not succeeded than to have never tried at all which you've already proven so many times, time and time again. And that brings me, I guess, maybe probably to my last question, unless there's a follow-up. Um, you know, uh, so I mean, you talk about mentors and you talk about the kinds of women that you sought out because it's easy to connect with them. That's also important with, when we talk about social media and the kinds of people that we then end up following or liking um, when we like their posts. And then you mentioned like versus love. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that uh, we, I'd like to talk about a little bit more sure. as well, because the difference between someone who's in your day to day life and really mentoring and sponsoring you, that, that person is looking out for you. It's a reciprocal relationship. Yeah. Um, it's a two way relationship. Whereas when you're um, finding someone who you respect and you connect with, quote unquote, um, also no pun intended there mm -hmm. um, on social media, it's a, it's a different story because, again, most often than not, even though you share that sometimes you should share your failures. Most often than not, they're not sharing their failures. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, when we talk about visible role models, for us, we want to see people like you who are visible role models telling their authentic story. And then there are other people who are in the limelight, not necessarily role models. Um, you don't actually know the struggles that they've gone through to get to where they are now. So if you had to talk to a young person mm -hmm. and um, just kind of distinguish the difference between um, how does, or, you know, but you already shared the conversation, but really uniquely, why would you, why should you spend more real time, face time with a mentor versus scrolling through your Instagram and trying to emulate um, others when you actually don't know what's going on in their life? Sure. So I want to start with that by really thinking about celebrities. So a lot of us follow celebrities on our social and we see all these fancy things, but as you said, we don't see the journey that got them there and they're celebrities. They're paid to do certain things. They all, 99% of them have a media person that posts for them. They're not sitting there scrolling and posting all the time and they're presenting their best selves. That's their job. And sometimes we get confused by that and we emulate a celebrity that's not actually who they are. If you got to know them in real life and you're friends with them, sure. But the face online is not really a person like me or you. So I think it's really important to do that, to think about celebrity versus a person, you know, that you're following. And, that, and like, an, like an influencer versus like Shaliza Jamal, me, you know, who you're following. Because there is that distinction. And um, part of growing your maturity around digital media is really understanding and critically thinking. And I really say that we need to empower ourselves to critically think about what is real and what is not. So that's the first thing. Um, and then I think um, back to that is for me, I do unfriend or unfollow people who are not positive um, role models for me. And I look for quotes. Um, when I see my friends often share things with me, if there's someone who's saying a quote, it's positive, um, I might start following that person. Um, if I see someone on my feed, even if they're my friend, who's always saying something negative about a certain type of person or about their life, I might unfollow them because that's not healthy for my uh, sense of well-being. So 
That's the first thing. Then again, I never connect with any mentor online because that's not how relationships work. Yes, oftentimes I have to give them a phone call because they're really, really busy and I appreciate and respect that. But even a phone conversation is much better than just connecting online. But I will tell you a secret. I will say that this year I've got a lot of people reaching out to me and I'm reaching out to people because they're showing the positive work they're doing through social media. So for example, I had a friend connect with me and I haven't spoken to her since undergrad. So I'm aging myself at about 14 years ago. So she messaged me and she said, Shalisa, I noticed all the great work you're doing. Congratulations on graduating for Harvard. I want to know more about the workshops you're doing because I work at the anti-racism directorate and we might be hiring facilitators. Let's connect. Through that, it went to email. It went to phone call, a few phone calls. I had a workshop. She came and then it developed into a better friendship. We had lunch together. Um, you know, she hired someone who did my photos to do her photos. And it's like become a very supportive relationship through her seeing the work I was doing on social media. I recorded a podcast recently because someone saw the great work I was doing and asked me. So those are positive ways. But in terms of mentorship, you need to have that one on one human connection, because if people are going to vouch for you and mentor you or sponsor you, they need to see who you are in real life. Because as we said before, you're only going to see the highlights, not the lowlights. Um, on social media. And so that personal connection, that face to face communication, like you can see, I'm staring at this, um, this camera, but I, I feel connected to you all. That's why sometimes I'm looking down at the screen below, like that's very, very important. And that's why actually I wasn't ready for it. But I'm glad that there's a video. So you can put a, a face to my name, and we can build that connection. Because at the end of the day, if social media internet goes dark, what do we have human connection? How do we um, form relationships? human connection. That's really what's going to help you. So digital media has a place, has a role and a purpose. But human connection is really important. So when I sought out my mentors, oftentimes, um, let's say uh, someone was running a workshop, and I really wanted to get to know that person, I might go to their workshop, I might get to know them, or if it's an educator that um, has supported you in the past, or is currently supporting you, ask them if you can um, sit in on a class. Or, um, you know, if you're ever in Toronto, Call me, you know, we can we can go for coffee or if there's um, someone who's uh, if you want to do law, for example, I'm making that up law. If you want to be a lawyer um, and, you know, maybe um, Hitol or a speak mentorship or someone connects you to somebody, you can go to a workshop they're running. You can go meet them for coffee, go to their workplace, say, can I shadow you for a day? You're at a really um, opportune time in your um, high school life because grade 11, 12, there's a lot of support for you or there can be a lot of support for you. Ask your guidance counselor. Maybe their cousin is a lawyer. Whatever it is you want to do. If you want to go into music. If you ask people questions, you will be connected. And then you can start to make those um, connections real by visiting, making opportunities, really going, um, making your opportunities happen for yourself through coffees, through phone calls, through observations, just, you know, shadowing. That's what I'm doing too. I, I want to build my uh, business and my experience as an equity and inclusion coach. And so I connected with someone who said, um, yeah, why don't you connect with X person and tell them you want to shadow them and volunteer for free to work at one of their events and learn from them. So I'm still doing that. And I still encourage all of you to do that. Um, you know, and, and that's how you can learn what you love, gain confidence and gain good mentorship. I hope that answers the question. It does. And that's actually a plug for our flagship program. Thank you. So in our flagship program, that's actually what we do with our high school students is we connect them with three different mentors um, who are in their careers of interest. And so again, it's it's because we want them to start seeking out visible role models, but also making the real yeah. human to human connections so they can start right. um, finding opportunities. And so with social media, I think, you know, the biggest thing is that um, imposter syndrome before social media was when you're trying to fit in to spaces because um, you don't see enough of yourself there. Now what social media has done, it's you know added another level to imposter syndrome, which is now that you only think you're, uh, or that you believe that everybody's life is all together. Um, and your life is just never all together. And so it does cause another level of you know depression due to kind of really not being able to see yourself as 
um, successful or not belonging or again, not having it together. And so um, unfortunately, a lot of young people do deal with the, the impacts of social media, but as you mentioned, social media, um, depending on what you're posting can re result in opportunities. And so what I would, and I'm not very big on social media myself, um, but when I do post on social media, it is for speak mentorship because that's something that I feel people should know about. And, um, you know, as far as my personal life, I like to keep that keep that to myself. And yeah, we were talking about how that one um, application was rescinded because uh, of something that Harvard had found on his social media from years before, because they do still assume that as um, an adolescent, 15, 16, 17 year old, you're still able to distinguish between, um, you know, the right and wrong messaging, or you're able to have choose um, your own value system. And if that doesn't fit with the college or university, then that might impact your, your, um, you know, whatever opportunity you mm -hmm. get, which, which did happen to this young man. Yep. And it's, there's been a lot of debates around it. So um, I want to thank you once again. This is how people can connect with you. So again, thank you for also um, adding uh, ways that people can connect with you right now. And we do hope that people do take the time to connect with Shaliza. Um, again, given that she has shared her story so authentically, I can only imagine how authentically you develop the relationships you. that you forge with the people that you meet um, on a daily basis. So again, thank you for being so genuine and ending um, our 2018-2019 speaker series with on such a positive note. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you all for um, being here today and for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And again, this the, these talks always go to, um, they're always on our YouTube channel so people can view them um, at a later time. And then they also go to different schools to help um, with different topics that we want the young people to learn about. Um, and this is definitely critical to the, to the, next, to the younger generation, um, given how much they are uh, the how central social media is to their to their lifestyle. So um, our next speaker series, 2019-2020, we're already confirming we'll be releasing our full 2019-2020 cohort um, just within a few weeks. But an example of one of our speakers, October speaker, is um, Adam Bunkedeko. He is um, going to be talking about leadership. And as you see here, he recently ran for a Democratic nomination to represent New York's 9th Congressional District. Um, he's been in the grassroots uh, organizing space for quite some time. And uh, right now he's a strategy and innovation officer for local initiative support corporation in New York and just does phenomenal work to uplift the community is he's a Queens native, um, although he lives in Brooklyn now, and um, shout out to Brooklyn too. And um, so people like Adam, we also have uh, a clinical psychiatrist from Cornell who will be joining us, um, and we, uh, Dr. Lee, and we also have people from the finance and accounting space. We also have people from the law space. Um, so all of those speakers will uh, be announced in just a couple of weeks. And uh, once again, thank you so much for everybody joining our 2018. 19 speaker series and Shaliza for joining today. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.